Is it possible to add more diversity to the views and topics that have been proposed? Uh, I am the only member of the European Monetary Union on this panel. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> when the question is raised about exiting crisis, I think for many Spaniards the question is exiting Eurozone. And I would like to start with a little comment on uh, needed reform of the Eurozone arrangements uh, to then uh, touch upon the issue of stimulation and finally uh, labor reform. As you know, uh, when the euro was uh, introduced and the eurozone defined, many prominent economists questioned the viability of a monetary union among nations subject to major idiosyncratic shocks. And of course, history is revealed that uh, they were right, and today many more economists are saying there is a basic problem there, and the way out is to introduce fiscal integration between the Eurozone countries. Now, I understand fiscal integration to mean pooling of public resources and public expenditures, and it is quite clear that uh, at this stage, nobody sees any prospect for fiscal integration over the Eurozone in the near or, me or medium run. And then, of course, those who insist on the flows of the current system and to have no other suggestion than fiscal integration are a little bit at a loss as to what to suggest next. And uh, there is a variety of minor ancillary suggestions. So I would like to get the reactions of my distinguished friends on this panel to the feasibility of uh, running a monetary use and union without the difficult step of fiscal integration. Uh, my point is that uh, <coughs> the main objection to fiscal integration is the extensive redistribution across nations that would follow, whereas one starts from the idea of coping with idiosyncratic shocks. Now, coping with shocks is a matter of insurance rather than redistribution. And I think we should consider the possibility of organizing mutual insurance among the Eurozone countries in a non-redistributive way. Let me indicate how this might work. It would work through exchange of bonds indexed on the national income of the member countries. Each Eurozone member, like Spain, would emit long-term bonds in euros, yes, but indexed on the country's national income. And it would do this, say, for 30% of the total national income. That means that the bonds so emitted would each year pay out the equivalent of 30% of the national income of Spain as realized for that year. Every Eurozone country does that, and they 
bring all these bonds into a common pool. Now comes the difficult part, value these bonds. Let me, for the purpose of explaining the scheme, assume that the members of Eurozone agree on valuing these bonds. If they were one-year bonds, it would be national income. That would be straightforward. If they are 30-year bonds, you have to compute a present value that takes risks into account. But suppose they agree on the value of each bond, and then each country is given a percentage of the pool corresponding to the value that it contributes as a percentage of the total values. And in this way, what happens? Each country is exchanged the risks affecting its national income up to 30% against the risks affecting the Eurozone as a whole for its part of it. And in this way, you are reducing the extent of idiosyncratic risks interfering with the use of a common currency. Uh, it's a fairly complicated scheme, perhaps. The important point is to understand that when you do this exchange at the start, nobody gains and nobody loses, provided the evaluation is made correctly. You are not redistributing, you are mutualizing risks. Now, there is, of course, one problem that will be raised immediately, for instance, by some members of this panel, namely moral hazard. If a country were exchanging 30% of its national income for a share of the Eurozone national income, wouldn't, wouldn't this country lose incentives to be productive, efficient, uh, and to raise its national income. And of course, moral hazard is an issue that uh, interferes with many insurance schemes. And in this case, I do not know of any relevant evidence bearing on this issue except perhaps the experience of federations, federations like the US, Canada, Germany, and others, where in fact you have local entities, states, provinces, lender, who belong to a federation where a substantial share of the risks affecting a local unit, like the state of California or the land of Bayern, a major share of the risks affecting that unit is taken over by the federation and distributed over all the units that belong to it. And this is done to extents varying from 30, 35, percent in the US to 45, 50 percent in Canada. So it would seem reasonable to hope that one could organize the Eurozone with the mutualization of say 30, 35 percent of the national risks without running into more severe moral hazard problem than are encountered in federations. Mind you, 35, 40%, that is the order of magnitude of the share 
of the public budget in national income. And that would mean, of course, that from the viewpoint of public finance, this scheme would have solved the problem that uh, was raised and experienced about the Eurozone. Uh, that is one issue. I don't know how others feel about it or whether maybe I am missing from some information. The other issue is to value the promise coming from each country. And uh, again, we have no market valuation. Bonds indexed on national income are not uh, quoted on stock exchanges. And there is a question, would one rely on stock market valuation for bonds indexed on national income. I personally would feel that uh, cooperation between the statistical offices of the relevant international organization and the select group of economists should be asked to look into this issue. To conclude on this uh, topic, the question is, should we ask the Eurozone authorities to study in depth the prospect of such a mutual insurance scheme? I personally feel that it would be very appropriate to study this very carefully hoping that it may prove an important instrument to enable Europe to achieve what it hopes to achieve through the euro, which is not so much an economic as a political benefit. But this is one man's opinion, and I would be very interested to hear whether others would back me in urging the Eurozone authorities to study this problem. Very briefly now on the issue of uh, austerity versus uh, stimulation. My view uh, of uh, fiscal policy is that there are three distinct challenges uh, that uh, fiscal policy sometimes uh, is asked uh, to meet. One is uh, intergenerational risk sharing. We have a very good example of this. The generations of the last three or four years have suffered a very deep depression, the cost of which should be spread in the same way that the cost of wars is spread. The in difficult question is over how many years or generation, but that's part of the problem. There is the issue of redistribution across generations, which is a different question altogether and a difficult one. And then there is the issue of circumstances where demand stimulation is wanted but you cannot ask fiscal policy as one instrument to accomplish these three tasks. And in my eyes, <coughs> fiscal policy should be concerned with intergenerational risk sharing and the tool for demand simulation, if and when recognized as necessary, should be public investment. Public investment financed by bonds is neutral from the viewpoint of intergenerational redistribution of risk sharings if the investments are uh, valid. Now, European countries are too small and too open to choose 
demand stimulation on their own because part of the benefit goes to the neighboring countries through the imports. The level at which demand stimulation through public investment makes sense is either the European Union or the Eurozone. And uh, I think that today <coughs> it would be extremely helpful to engage in Eurozone-wide coordinated public investments. I think that is possible <coughs> with investments that yield returns that will permit servicing the bonds in such areas as uh, low-cost housing for underprivileged families, like uh, green energy or uh, toll roads. And uh, again, the issue is preparation is needed. I am running out of time. <laughs> but my question is the same as the previous one. Do you think that it would be appropriate to urge the Eurozone or European Union to prepare European level programs of public investment. On the matter of labor reform, uh, I think that if we want to engage today in labor reform, and there is a lot that could and should be done, we should do it not to remedy today's situation, but to remedy the <coughs> persisting underactivity that has been observed in many European countries over the years. The high peak in youth unemployment is strongly linked to the current recession. Uh, but uh, over the longer experience in Europe, unskilled workers, senior workers, and women have been the three categories with the most obvious excessive employment. I have for 20 years been advocating lower social security contributions of employers on the lower wages. And this has been uh, put into practice to some extent in France and Belgium and studied with undeniable benefits. Uh, clearly, we need better education if we want less unskilled underactivity and there is a lot to be done in that area. One interesting experience is that of apprenticeship in Germany, and I am very surprised not to see more other European countries trying to imitate the German apprenticeship system. No time left for women, that's too bad, really. Uh, <laughs> Not that I had something dramatic to say, even if I have been campaigning for years to convince the Catholic Church to treat men and women equally. But no time <laughs> to go into that further. Well, I want to thank all of you for all interventions. I'm a little afraid we are a little short of time. Uh, but I think that even it has been quite, all, uh, as you said, different uh, interpretations, and you came up even with a very concrete policy proposal, which I think has to be the thought. I think there are things in, uh, in common in all the interventions, and, and it starts one point that already in the first one of Ashenfelder mentioned, which is this issue about the losing accord. And in the sense that something that came out, whether it's called unemployment or not, it's this unemployment is an extreme form of mismatch of misuse of human resources. 
And the problem in, in Spain is not only we have very high unemployment, but we had a lot of people for many years not getting a serious job. There is a lot of very short-term abuse of this kind of context. Well, so I this serious question is raised here is the idea that Spanish, young Spanish men have to go to Finland to meet good-looking girls. <laughs> 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 That's a new problem. I, I think I think and this is not right. There are fairly a, a lot of Finnish come here to also <laughs> look at <around, so. laughs> In any case, I think that the uh, thing that we all agree is that it's not only an issue of now, but it's an issue that will take much longer. And more serious, deep reform uh, we can face. One thing that uh, has been on the table, but is also in the discussion, a lot of these issues, we have tools more to do the more applied work in economics, but also the more theoretical work, so mechanism design, to give uh, prescriptions. And many economists in Spain have been looking at this. And we have been making proposals for a long time on trying to break more this duality of the labor market that we have seen real wages going up during the crisis uh, of the uh, more permanent employed people while we have all this destruction of employment. So I think there are many things that uh, people can learn that we can make improve even any of the reforms that we have on the table. So I think that we have a good example today of ideas, and we have many more that we can offer. So I want to thank all of you for the coming. I'm sorry we don't have more time for discussion, but that's what was left. <laughs> Thanks to all of you.